So glad to have you here this morning. And for those who may be watching the video, so glad to have you. We've had a lot of things going on in this congregation. As far as physical illnesses, we've suffered a, a death loss. The funeral is tomorrow. And I've chosen a sermon and song today to kind of talk about what's going on inside of us. And I read, tempted and tried, were oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. That, that second line, why it should be this way every day, while others are living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. The struggle that Christians have always had is how can a loving God allow us to suffer when people who do not love him seem to have it so easy so much of the time? And this is nothing new. Psalm 73 talks about this very thing. And yet this song says further along, We'll know all about it. But the phrase that I like in this song further along is, cheer up my brother, live in the sunshine. And I would like to change the wording of that word sunshine to S-O-N-S-H-I-N-E. Psalm 73, verses 1 through, uh, 1 through 9. There's going to be a lot of scripture reading in today's lesson and some singing as we go through the lesson. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death. Their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men. Nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eyes bulge from fatness. The imagination of their heart runs riot. They mock and speak wickedly of impression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongues parades through the earth. You see, the struggle that righteous people have in the fact that they struggle like other people, and yet they're loyal to God, they can't make sense out of it. And yet I like the way Psalm 73 ends. He says, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your works. Let's sing that first stanza, not the chorus, but the first stanza of that song. <clears throat> Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long, while there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Here's what the second stanza says. When death has come and taken our loved ones, it leaves our home so lonely and drear. And we wonder why others prosper living so wicked year after year. As I have just said, this struggle is nothing new. And so we go to the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And we listen to Naomi. 
For Naomi has left Judah and had gone to another country, and there her husband died, and both of her sons died without having any children. And now she goes back home to Judea, and she meets her friends. And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. That word means pleasant. Call me Mara. That word means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? But then I want to go to the end of the book of Ruth. For in the meantime, Ruth has met Boaz, and Boaz has given birth to a son. And that son is going to be in the lineage of Jesus, as is Ruth and Naomi. Then the women said to Naomi, Ruth chapter 4, and verse 14 through 16. Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And may his name be famous in Israel. May he also be the restorer of life and the sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. And then I think of David, and I think of the price that he paid for his sin. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead, since he might do himself harm? And yet, I remember David's reaction. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now that he has died, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And here it is. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Let's sing. When death has come and taken our loved ones, it leaves our home so lonely and drear. Then do we wonder why others prosper, living so wicked year after year? The third stanza says this, Faithful till death, said our loving master, a few more days to labor and wait, till the road will then seem as nothing as we sweep through the beautiful gate. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 Verses 10 through 11. The apostles are standing, watching Jesus as he goes up into heaven. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Death is not the end of it. Not for God's children, 
For at the end of our road, we know Jesus is coming again. And I think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who've fallen asleep. You see, they were concerned that if the Lord didn't come during their lifetime, everyone who had died would be left behind. There would be no hope for them. And so what God is having Paul tell the Christians then and now is that the dead in Christ will rise before we do. And together, well, let me continue to read. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Faithful till death said our loving Master, a few more days to labor and wait. Toils of the road will seem as nothing as we sweep through the beautiful gate. Sweeping through the beautiful gate gate reminds me of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. What do you hope for when this life is over? What do you hope for when you're feeling your worst? is the thought of heaven of comfort. It is to me. I hope it is to you. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Have you ever, in your worst moments, imagined what heaven would be like? I'm serious. Have you ever imagined what heaven is like in the worst of your moments? That's one reason this verse has been given to us. But I also like what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. All of these died in faith without receiving the promises but having seen them and welcomed them from a distance. That's us. That's not just these people of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. That's us. We see them and welcome them from a distance through the eyes of faith, acknowledging that while upon this earth, we are strangers and exiles waiting to go home. In fact, verse 14 says, For those who, those who say such things make it clear. They are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. As we face death, whenever that time may come, would we really rather stay on earth 
than go to heaven? Would we really rather live our life all over again rather than go to heaven? Let's sing that fourth stanza. When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home on the sky, then we shall meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. I will admit that I have a little problem with this last phrase. I'm not sure I'm going to care if I understand it all by and by. But I think we will understand whatever God wants us to understand so that we will have no tears and no sorrows and no pain and no regrets. Is that what you want? I know, I know what the atheists call this. They call it a pie in the sky. But bless their hearts, it's not a pie. It's heaven. And that's our goal. And we are spending our life on earth getting ready for heaven. I like Psalm chapter 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, listen to this, his delight is in the law of the Lord. There's a lot of people who like to skip the law and go straight to Jesus. My delight is in Jesus. but not his law, not his commandments, not the persecution that comes because I'm walking like he did. I just delight in Jesus and his love and his grace and how wonderful that is. But as far as obeying all of his will, his grace takes care of that. I don't have to obey what he says. His grace just wipes out law. That's another sermon, folks, and it's an important one a lot of people need to hear, but not this morning. Not this morning. Let's continue reading. So what are you going to be like if you delight in the law of the Lord? He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so. They're like the shaft which the wind drives away. Now that may not happen in this life, but on the day of judgment, they'll be like the husk of the wheat seed that is blown away when the winnowing, winnowing fork tosses the grain into the air. And the kernel will fall to the ground, and the shaft will be blown away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here's the fourth stanza.
When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home in the sky, then we'll meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. Further along we'll know all about it. Farther along we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Obviously, just included the chorus along with that fourth verse. How do we get to have the intent of this song? The acknowledgement that sometimes the life of God's people is as tough as life can get. How can we as God's people go through what one of our members just went through? I'm not calling the name because this is going out in the public. But we know who we're talking about. How can the widows and the widowers who are members of God's church walk through that path of death with their mate? the death of a child, the death of parents, the loss of a job, back problems, heart problems, cancer problems. How can we go through it and see people who do not love the Lord in any shape, form, or fashion and even speak against Him at every possible opportunity seem to never get sick and die that sudden ideal death, they go to bed at night happy and contented and wake up dead. Or should I say, don't wake up dead. How can we do that without envy? And the answer is, we know that our real life begins at death. That's what we know. And we can call it knowledge because our faith is that strong. I want to tell you about a man. He was from Ethiopia. And when I tried to find a picture of, of his baptism, I found that almost everyone depicted him as a black man, and he may have been, because the general population of Ethiopia was black. But there's also a possibility that the Jewish population had gone down into Ethiopia, and that, that this man was actually Jewish, for he had gone back to Jerusalem to worship. So whether he was a black man who had become a proselyte of Judaism, or whether he was a Jewish man who had become treasure for the queen of Ethiopia, we don't know. But we do know he had gone back to Jerusalem, and either he carried with him the scroll of Isaiah, or he had purchased, with a lot of money, the scroll of Isaiah while in Jerusalem. But he was on his way home reading it, and he was reading about the Messiah, but he didn't understand it was about the Messiah. And so God sends one of his Christian men to catch up with the chariot and to hear him actually reading from the book of Isaiah. And so he asked the man, do you know what you're reading? And he said, may I use my own terminology? He says, no, I don't. I need somebody to explain it to me. And so God's man 
Christian man gets up into the chariot and he opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture he preached Jesus to him. I want you to listen to three key words in this passage. Number one key word, what was preached to this man? If you know, raise your hand. Jesus was preached to him. Now let's listen to what happens when Jesus gets preached. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Word number two. If I preach Jesus the way God wants me to preach Jesus, and you're not a member of the body of Christ, and you believe what I preached, what are you going to ask me to do for you? Word number two, you are going to ask to be baptized into Christ. Let's continue reading. Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, I'm not making water the other third word. That's a part of being baptized scripturally, in water. But there's another word coming up that is that third word. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no longer, but went on his way, number three, rejoicing. Why? Because he had Jesus preach to him. He did what the preaching of Jesus required, and after that, he was entitled to rejoice. And now the song farther along can be his song, just as it can be ours once we have committed our life to live in Christ. Not, quote, getting baptized, but believing and converting ourselves to repentance and acknowledging our faith and sharing in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ when we're baptized. Yes, Christian. You are as subject to COVID and cancer and heart disease as anybody else. And you're as subject to losing your job and your house being burned and losing family members just like anyone else. But you're on a road. And at the end of that road, is heaven. 